All right, guys, thanks for joining us today. One of the things that I want to start off by mentioning is who here is really excited, is on fire when they think about hiring new people? All right, where's the noise? So, you know, one of the things that's really obvious to me and sometimes painfully obvious is our relationship to how we feel and how we think about the hiring process. Immediately, when a lot of people think about hiring and what's going on in, in the industry with trying to find good people, they're unsettled. There's a pain in their gut. It's like, oh my gosh, it's, it's just associated with so much misery. So I want to challenge you to change your relationship to how you feel about bringing new people into your business, how you feel about the hiring process. I want you to embrace the fact that it's not always fun. I want you to think of yourself as saying, you know what? I'm going to let everybody else struggle with hiring, and I'm going to be the person that says, this is going to be something that I'm going to have a lot of fun with. I'm going to try to create and build my team and build people. It's not about expecting people to show up already with the skills and the mindset and the amount of care and the amount of love that they're going to have for your business. It's about creating them. And that's one of the things that we want to talk about today. Is, is it, can we go to the first slide, please? Molly. All right, guys, squeeze in. Come on, show us some love. Come on in tighter. Come on in. Come on, we can't block the hallways. Let's come in a little bit. Come on, don't be shy. We're all going to be friends here. Come on in tight. One of the things that I want to talk about the very first and foremost is to hire for the mindset. The mindset is going to be more important than the skills that they bring in with that mindset because a guy that cares about their job, they're worth gold. They are worth gold. They may not have the skill. And what you're going to do is you're going to recognize a guy that when he comes into the company, he's going to be a little bit shy, but he's going to then get out of his shell. He's going to break out of that shell, and he's going to go grab the shovel, and he's going to keep himself busy even when there's nothing to do. You're going to have two kinds of guys come into your business. You're going to have this guy, and then you're going to have the guy that goes out and starts finding work to do. That's your first indicator. Right? When we hire for mindset, the guy that's willing to just keep moving, it doesn't sound like our grandpas would have rolled over in their grave right now if they heard me talking. But you guys all know that the guy that keeps moving is probably one of the most important assets you can have, even though he may not have the skills he, need, he needs at that point to grow in your business. That's your job, right? That's your job as the owner of the company to start to recognize the people that have the potential to grow to the next stage. Every person that I have in my company that runs my company right now started out with zero skills. I literally had to show them how to start equipment, check oil, run equipment. Some of them I still have to train how to properly turn off equipment because they just take a diesel engine and shut it right off and let the, the turbo overheat, right? So the little things, you're shaking your head because you know it, but the things that keep those people around me is I try to make them sticky people. I find the people that have the potential, and it's my job as a leader to develop that potential. It's your job as a leader to recognize the people that have the, uh, the growth opportunity, not today, but in six months or 12 months, and those are the people that you automatically start to connect with. Connecting with your people is the first step to making them sticky, okay? Do you think every person you bring into your company cares about money? Is that a main priority, do you guys think? Is money the main priority? No. Hell no. No, no, no. Most guys don't get money. They don't understand money. They need help with money. Their main priority could be setting up a grant for their daughter's college. Their main priority could be making their truck payment. Their main priority could be anything to do besides money management. So when you want to make people sticky, giving them a raise is not necessarily the best thing you guys can do. Connecting with those people and setting up very specific reasons why those people need to stick around can become a priority for those people. But that means that you've got to sit down and eat lunch with them. You've got to go out and find out what makes them tick, okay? So if you know that the guy's having trouble making his truck payment, what if you took that off his hands? What if you took his truck payment off his hands, okay? Instead of giving him a raise, you set up a fund to the side, and every month you made his truck payment for him. 
He's got enough money left over that he can still go out and eat. He's got enough money left over that he can still live his life. He's got enough money left over, but you've taken something off his plate. You've made him sticky. You've made him a member of your team, but more important than that, you showed that guy that you care about the things he cares about. Do you guys start to see where caring about the things that the people in your company care about creates and fosters an environment, a corporate environment that makes people want to come in, but you know what's more important than that? Is those people then go out and find people to work in your company. Do I have Elliot here? Elliot, you came to work for me and I said, we need help. Do we have Xander here? You recruited Xander for me because you knew that my company was an organization where you felt comfortable bringing people in. Your employee base right now, your family, your friends, are your recruiters. Do you guys get that? Do you guys see how you can start to leverage your relationships with people and use them to bring people into your company? I very rarely need to put out help wanted ads. I just start talking to people that I know. And I have a business that people want to work in. That's going to be your number one thing. Create the environment that makes people want to come into this business. Now today we're actually going to show you how to organize your business. We're going to show you how to create a business that goes anywhere from half a million dollars up to $5.4 million through organizational charts. We're going to be showing you a lot of different tips, techniques, and things that we actually use on a day-to-day -day basis. So. You know, one of the things that I want to note is when you're successful with having your own team that is efficiently running, I promise you the actions that you're going to be taking are going to be very unlike the actions that your competition is taking. Most of what is going to help you succeed in this industry and in this business will be completely opposite from what everybody else is already doing. Look, everybody else is already complaining about the employee problem, is already facing the struggles. Is We want you to do things differently. As Stan mentioned, he gave you a couple really unique ideas. Now, one of the practical steps that I want you to do is have a written process in place for what you do with a new employee during their first 30 days. I People talk about, like, I know I need to get better at training, and I know I want you to go back Monday morning and start a training process for people so when they come in they can get acclimated to your culture how you care about things I know you guys care I can see it when in our conversations when we talk I know how deeply you care for your customers I want you to start documenting what that care looks like on paper so people can have a handout and you can say this is our company culture step one here is how we greet the customer at in the when that when homeowners come outside we go we're going to turn our saws off. Any equipment that's making noise, we're going to stop. We're going to walk around. We're going to read people's eyes. When they look at our jobs questionably and they, they scratch their head, we want to walk up and say, is everything okay? Do you have a question about the project? You want to train your people to do that so you're not getting a text message that says, hey, boss, can you come by the job because the homeowner has a question? And you think to yourself, train them how to answer these questions. This is why you don't want to be doing everything yourself. This is the first step in the freedom that you're looking for in your business is teaching your people how to communicate with your customers. Okay, guys. There's two things that you need to do. First off is constant recruitment. Even if you don't need help, can you always use a rock star? Can you always use the next best person inside your company? I don't know a single person that would turn down an amazing individual because your businesses, guys, are going to be built on your team. Your team was the one that the, your team is what gives you the freedom to go out and find bigger and better jobs. Your team is what actually accomplishes the work that you find, and your team is what actually creates the profits that build your company. So constant recruitment is something you should be continually doing. Never turn down an opportunity to meet with someone, to talk with someone, to make a connection right because it's like the ripple effect you throw a rock in the water and that spreads out every time you make that conversation whether you're ready to hire that person at that moment or not you may have a guy that doesn't show up the next day and you've got a resume of a guy that you want to hire you've already made a connection you already know that and if that guy is not is no longer available for you do you know what you do 
you ask them, do you have any friends? Because you were so awesome, maybe somebody you would recommend. Remember, it's about making that connection and talking to these people. But a lot of times, even with all of our best efforts, we still don't have enough help. So sometimes we got to turn to technology. We have to turn to technology. So we have to figure out ways that we can become better, faster, more efficient, less manpower, and then more equipment. So I want you to do it in a very strategic way. I don't want you to go out and buy equipment because the Joneses have equipment. If you do that, call me up. I'm going to come over and kick you in the butt. That's the worst thing you guys can do. You buy equipment to eliminate manpower on a very strategic basis. So if you have a job, I buy equipment for jobs. I'll go out and buy a $40,000 excavator for one job. And then I'll sell it when I'm done with the job. I will eliminate that out of my fleet. I will eliminate that overhead out of it. But I know that one piece of equipment for that one very specific job will eliminate two guys on that job. But I don't eliminate those guys. I free those guys up to do more jobs. Uh, I free them up to go out and make me more money. That is the key element. Make sure that you balance your fleet, your manpower, with your jobs. Buy the equipment the right way. Hey. Who here knows that there's brokers and dealers that make a ton of money just buying and selling equipment, right? Everybody nod your head because we know that's a fact. Is there any reason why you guys can't go out and buy a piece of equipment the right way, flip it and sell it after you're done using it for a month or two months or a year? Absolutely not. There's brokers doing it all the time. So as you hunt for people, hunt for equipment, one of the things I want to point out to you is hunt for opportunity. An opportunity is never lost. Somebody will always find it. So if you can't spot that opportunity, somebody else will. Whether that's in your manpower, whether that's in your equipment, or how you utilize technology to the advantage to grow your business, to make you more profitable, to keep you working onward and upward to the bigger, better, next job. So when in, you, in continuing that thought about utilizing technology, I want you to place that effort on how, especially for me, this has been key in the office. I have been able to use technology to my advantage with, with the combination of QuickBooks, with Jobber software, by using these systems that will prevent me from always doing redundant data entry work. And I will tell you, when I transitioned in a lot of my systems to be electronic and to use, and to use these apps, it wasn't easy. It was met with a certain amount of discomfort. It's like you got that learning curve and sometimes Sometimes that keeps us trapped in doing the same things because we know like, okay, this winter I'm going to take it on and this is the year that I'm going to actually transition all that data. The folks here at Jobber are here to make a lot of this seamless for you and to make this process much easier. I want you to, at the very least, for your office systems, put the right technology into use, talk to the guys at Jobber, look at your systems internally. That's going to free you up to look at your processes and decide, who is it that I need to hire? In every one of our businesses, it can be divided up into three main sections, sales, production, and office. And some of you show up with different problems or different challenges in different areas. Some of you guys are still in the field year after year, and you're saying to yourself, like, I really need to get myself out of the field. You're going to want to focus your energy in production. And we've got some lists here of actual job positions for every one of these things that you see, labor or one labor to crew leader these are descriptions that you want to write you want to identify the areas that you need to hire for you might need a labor instead of just putting the ad out for the labor I want you to write down that job description so when the right people come along you're able to hand it to them and say here is what is expected of you here is how I'm going to measure your performance here is the track that you can take for advancement if you meet these goals when people come on I also want you to be setting review dates for people don't let it be a shock to them, when they're going to get compensation increases, when they're going to be evaluated on their performance. I want you to say, here's your hire date. On the anniversary of your hire date after six months or after one year, you and I are going to sit down. I'm going to evaluate your performance. We're going to discuss any pay increases. 
The same holds true for any other area of your business. In your sales, in your office, I want you to break down the different things. And you already know the descriptions. Do you know why? Because you're doing the job. So part of coming up with the description is documenting a typical day for yourself. What are you doing in a day? Take a notepad and follow yourself around. Be a student of your own actions and your own activities and take the time to document it so you know what to tell people because you have it all up here in your head. Get it out of your head onto paper and it frees up your headspace to do the really valuable things in your business. Guys, who loves paperwork? Right, I hate paperwork. Screw paperwork. But there's people that do like paperwork. There's people, you like paperwork. Right there, I saw you, right? You're like, I like paperwork. So if you don't like paperwork, find somebody that does, right? You guys gotta start to identify your own skills. What I really want you to do is I want you to figure out what you're good at, become the master of that, because if you focus on building up the things that you're mediocre at, you're never going to excel. But when you take your strengths, when you take the thing that drives you, the passion that makes you alive, and you focus on building that up, you will dominate your market. That's how you dominate. And what you do then is you use a magic word that I was teaching to one of my young dirt monkeys just earlier today, and it's called delegate. Delegate is a beautiful word. Delegate is a word that should become part of your verbal repertoire for a long time, right? So you want somebody that's going to do your paperwork. Guess who sucks at internet? This guy does. So I teamed up with the gal right back there. Her name's Kelly. Everybody wave at Kelly. Kelly, who's the master of the internet, of the web, of organizing Dirt Monkey? It's you. It's this girl, right? I'm also not really good at putting together these beautiful slides. I don't do that. You know who does? This guy does. These guys are my team. These guys are the foundation that actually created Dirt Monkey University, and you guys need to create your team to fill in the holes to do the things that you don't want to do. When you do that, it's like taking a weight off your shoulders and it allows you to go out and pursue the things that you're really good at. So let's just say that you really like working in the field. You love working in the field. Your passion is actually doing the install. There's nothing wrong with that. Then create an office manager that can do all the scheduling for you, that can order the materials for you. Create somebody, maybe you don't like doing sales. Hire a salesperson. Hire a person to fill in the gaps to allow you to concentrate on the one thing, two things, however many things you guys are really good at. I want you to focus on those things. That means you gotta take a long, hard look at yourself, and that means if you're not very realistic with yourself, you're gonna, pull, you're gonna put yourself behind. So sometimes, this is gonna sound a little weird, ask other people. Ask other people what makes you tick, Ask other people what you think you could use help on. But don't ask them to be nice. Don't ask them to sugarcoat it because this is a very hard look that you need to take it yourself to grow to the next step, okay? Do you guys get what I'm saying with this? Are you guys following me along? Come on, can you guys hear me? I wanna see if you can. All right, go ahead, Phil. All right, so over the course of the next six or seven slides, I wanna take you from a million dollar company up to a five and a half million dollar company. And one of the things that I want you to focus on is always maintaining your presence as the president, as the top of your company. Now there's a book that everyone's probably very familiar with called E-Myth that says don't work on your business, or don't work in your business, work on your business. I'm gonna tell you about half of that is BS. We are not in a business that we're not gonna get our hands dirty. Don't race to the point where you are completely hands off. I want everybody to get there, but if you start there and say, well, starting Monday morning, I am not gonna touch anything because I was told that I'm gonna work on my business and not in my business. We are gonna continue to get our hands dirty at a decreasing rate as time goes on and you're gonna do it slowly and transition yourself up. 
out. So when you are cutting lawns, when you are picking up trash on a job site, when you are making a sales call, when you're working till midnight, you're still the president of the company up here in your mind. I don't want you to ever lose focus of that. So at a smaller company, at a million dollar company, it is very realistic. And this is an example. This may not be exactly how it works in your business, but roughly with two installation crews and maybe a maintenance crew, you're at a million dollar business. We can go to the next slide. Each slide as it progresses is just going to go through in red the positions that you would need to add. One of my favorite things to do, this is maybe my own sickness in my head and I'm sure the, the young lady who likes to do paperwork will be in line with me. I love creating these flow charts. Guys, I used to create these charts at night on a scrap sheet of paper. I do it on napkins when I was bored, but it was just me experimenting with what my company was going to look like someday as it began to grow, but it gave it some structure and it got a little more formal over time and we can go to the next slide as well so by the time you hit a two million dollar company you can start to see everything is going to continue with the president you being at the top of your company and you're increase you're putting in these key management positions but by the time we get and we can go through the next few just fairly quickly you're adding in just layering once you get that first layer perfect and set it's a matter of duplicating and duplicating is a word that you hear a lot we've got to duplicate ourselves to grow our business but this is where I said you how does this all begin how do I get to this point where there's layers upon layers well Monday morning you take out a notepad and you follow yourself around you document what it is you're doing that is the very first fundamental step of getting to this point where you have layers and documents you can tell people exactly what they need to do to step into that position as your company grows and you will find yourself at the point where you're free, finally free. Okay, guys, this is called a top-down management system, and I'm going to guess most of you don't do this. Most of you right now are probably experiencing what's called a hub-and-spoke management system. And a hub-and-spoke management system basically means you guys are the center of the wheel and everything revolves around you guys. When everything revolves around you guys, you're the bottleneck. You're the thing that's preventing you from growing. The hub and spoke you need to graduate up from. There are no million, two million, or five million dollar businesses running right now that live and survive off from the hub and spoke business model that has a CEO that is still sane. Okay, we want you to grow, but we want you to relax. We want you to be able to uh, delegate people and do things a little bit differently. Remove yourself from the hub and spoke business model. What does that involve, guys? Trust. It's a hard thing to do, isn't it? Give up a piece of your company, you're smiling in the back. Giving up a piece of your company is a really difficult thing to do, isn't it? Because you're afraid. Do you, do you work off from a fear model? Because a lot of guys do. They're afraid to give up the thing that built their business in the first place. But when you give up that little thing that built your business in the first place to somebody else, and you watch them, because you're still the owner, you still better dang well control every component of your business and know what's happening, but that doesn't mean you've got to be doing it. That means you have freed yourself. You've lifted the weight off from your shoulders and you've put it onto somebody else's shoulders that you trust. Trust is the key element. And then trust that they'll take it to the next step for you. Remember, your team is the most important thing you have. As a hub and spoke business model, you're not empowering your team. You are taking on full responsibility for every decision that, re that is inside of your business. You are the bottleneck, you are the slow point. Stop doing that. Delegate that responsibility out to different members inside of your organization. And what's going to happen is, I want you to delegate to the point where you're bored. I want you to go, oh crap, okay. Crew A is running, crew B is running, crew C is doing their thing, to get to the point where now your visionary sense can kick back in. The, the thing that drove you to become an entrepreneur in the first place can then become refreshed because burnout is a very real thing. A lot of guys get burnt out really fast because they try to do absolutely everything. I did a talk just a little bit earlier over at the booth and I talked about the fact that I have 
I don't know, two or three crews running right now today, and I can't tell you what job they're at. I can't tell you where they're at. I can't tell you even what equipment they're using or what they're doing or where the jobs are located because my business runs itself. I literally have to call up my manager and go, hey, where, where is everybody today? And he'll give me a list of jobs that we're working on. And then I can go out and take a look at those jobs. But do you think that I did that overnight? No, it took me 20 some years of being sick of being a contractor, of being sick of wearing out my knees, pounding blocks in and going, I can pay somebody to do this. I'm going to pay somebody to do this. I want to be back into the position where I love my business. Anybody here ever experienced burnout besides me? I mean, I'm, I'm, I've gotten there, man. I've gotten to the point in the past where I've pounded on the steering wheel of my dump truck, cursing myself out for what I have built myself into a corner, not freeing myself. And I stopped at one point and I said, I'm done. I'm going to start hiring this out. And I kept laying responsibility onto the individual members of my team, and I did that by empowering them. I empowered them beyond what they thought they could do. I never had a single person come into my company that said, I can run this better than you, that I would let run my business. Anybody that was that cocky and arrogant that came into my company was out the back door as soon as they came in the front door. But I had guys that came in and go, I don't know, boss, I don't know if I could do this. But then they tried. And when I seen them try, I said, you can keep doing this. And then I would foster them. I would grow them. I would nurture them like you're watering a seed because that's the guy. Remember, we're hiring for mindset. We're not necessarily hiring for skill. We're going to empower the guys to believe in themselves. When you empower the guys to believe in yourselves, you know what risk you take? A lot. It's the trust factor. You, you risk that that guy is going to leave your company. You're, going, you're risking that, that when that guy leaves your company, he's going to take everything he built with him. But you are continuing to network. You are continuing to recruit. I just had a guy graduate out of my company just a month ago. Do you think I still communicate with him? Uh, hell no, I drug him to the GIE with me. Where is he? Little hands, right there. Wave him. Yeah, he graduated. He started his own company just a couple months ago from everything that he learned from working with me. Does it hurt? Frick yeah. I don't want him to go. I, don't, I mean, he's a good equipment operator. He's dedicated. He's there. But I also want him to live his dream. And I know that as he's going out there and he sees somebody that's worthy, he's going to send them my way. So I've planted a seed that's flown off. It's going to sprout somewhere else, but it's gonna keep bringing results back to me. And I'm going to keep communicating with them. That's the most important thing, you guys. You have to trust these people. You have to nurture them, but you also have to know that sometimes they're gonna graduate, but with the right network underneath you, you can move somebody else upward into that spot. I want you guys to know that I have failed miserably so many times I cannot even count in building that whole business model, but it took a few times of succeeding and multiple times of failing and, and running into a brick wall or so it seemed. Listen, at, I use the example of water. Water at 212 degrees boils. At 211 degrees, absolutely nothing happens. It is still water. I don't want you to stop when you are at 211 degrees, when you may be one more step away from succeeding. So many times we hit failures or we fall flat on our face or we say, I've tried to hire people and they always fail me, they always let me down, I want you to try one more time and then one more time after that because most people quit when they are this close to succeeding because the lure of what is comfortable, doing it all ourselves, we say we give up the promise of the future we say okay I'm willing to be tired because at least I get what that feels like I'm going to just do it all myself don't stop go through that one last layer of discomfort and embrace the fact that it's not always going to be a pretty process but the payoff is 
massive. And leverage the relationships that you have with the folks at Jobber. Talk to them. Say, listen, I don't want to handle all this stuff myself. What can you guys do for me to make my business a success? How can you help me? What tools do you have? Leverage Dirt Monkey University. What tools do you guys have? Take advantage of these relationships with your peers. Get dialed in and connected and build relationships here at GIE. And you're going to find that your businesses are going to take off. So those relationships that Phil are talking about should also extend to a very close network of people right in your local area as well, okay? So a relationship is key. We've talked about the team building that relationship, estab establishing that rapport with your team members because that's what they value. They don't necessarily value money, right? So the relationship that you have with your equipment dealer, with your banker, with your accountant. Do you guys have a personal cell phone number for your banker? Here who, here, who does? Okay, not everybody. If you guys w work at a bank where your banker doesn't know who you are and hasn't asked to take you out to lunch, you're working at the wrong bank. My banker calls me up and says, once a month, can we go out and eat lunch? It's not because I'm the dirt monkey, it's because I own a business that works through his financial institution. I also know that when I need a loan, when I need money, when I need anything inside of the banking system, I got a dude that's gonna cover my back. I also have an accountant that knows my business better than I do. He knows when I'm not on schedule with things, he keeps me lined up. I, it's because I leverage relationships, I look for people to team up with. Do you guys see where the teamwork component needs to be in every component of your business? It needs to be with your equipment operators, your, your equipment suppliers, your material suppliers, okay? Here's a beautiful thing. How do you establish credit with a material supplier, right? You got a formal piece of paperwork that you got to fill out. You got 30 days to do it, yada, yada, yada. Or you could do it the way I do it and pay them when I want to. I pay my material supplier when I want to because a little trick I did, I sat down at the end of the year and I didn't pay them all year long. And then I took my material supplier out to lunch and I sat down and I wrote $250,000 worth of checks out to my material supplier over lunch at Perkins. And I, that was my sticky point to make that guy realize that I'm the real deal, he wants a relationship with me, I'm his primary customer, he knows that money is no issue when it comes to him getting paid. He doesn't have to chase me down. I'm going to take him out to lunch and I'm going to pay him everything that he needs. But what do I get in return? My materials delivered whenever I want. I get my stuff delivered before the next guy that is six weeks behind or two months behind or doesn't, doesn't communicate, doesn't pay his bills. I'm the guy, I'm primary. It's because I did a very strategic thing by letting my balance get up there and then paying him all at once so he got the big bug eye look, right? I wanted him to get that big bug eye look. I wanted him to know that I'm his guy, I'm his main guy. And that worked because it's about leveraging a relationship. Every person that's inside of your industry in your local community, you should have a relationship with. Let's go over who the primary and most important people are for you guys, your banker. Go find a banker that knows your business. Your accountant, your accountant is huge. Guys, if you go to H&R Block and they look at you like a deer in headlights, like they don't know who you are, you have the wrong accountant, why are you smiling? It's so true, it's so true. I have an accountant that calls me up and tells me when stuff is due, he just does everything for me and I just nod, I smile and I go thank you because I've sat down with him multiple times and established a relationship with him. Do you know why I'm here with these guys? Because I vetted them. Vetting means I looked at them very closely, I seen what they were about, I spent hours on the phone talking to these guys knowing that you guys were more important than just a number on a piece of paper. And I said, if we're going to set up a system that helps contractors automate their business, I wanna be with these guys. I don't wanna be with somebody else that you guys don't matter, okay? Even if they're better in some way, shape, or form, or whatever they do, I want, so, I want to connect with somebody that connects with you guys. That's why. It's about establishing relationships everywhere you go. Everything you do, you should be building that rapport, establishing that relationship that puts your business on cruise control. 
that's how come I can be here right now talking to you guys and I have a business that's doing its own thing because I've done it with my crews in my business, I've done it with my suppliers, I've done it with my financial institutions, and I've done it with Dirt Monkey University with different vendors that I work with there. So you guys need to go out and understand the power of relationships and leverage that power for everything that it's worth. That's the most powerful thing you guys can do and your employees are part of that. The idea with this is how to build an army. Your army is more than just your crew. Your army is everybody around you that helps you run your business. Your army is everything that you can possibly connect with on every level to help you grow your business. At church, every member of that church congregation should know if you're a landscaper or a land care guy, landscaping or lawn care guy, right? Because there's just so many opportunities for you to connect with people and you are missing them if you're not making those little tiny connections that have a very big impact down the road. Yeah, that's the whole, that's the whole point of this. And we're gonna, I'm, I'm gonna wrap it up. I can't say it much better than the way you just said it, but the point is your army is more than just the people that are on your payroll. Far, far more. It's everybody you touch. And I want you to approach it as how can you help them? You know, how can you help your vendors? How can you help your clients? If you are always in the mindset of what can I give, you will receive far, far more and, than, than it was ever imaginable. So go out there, see how much you can give, challenge yourself to build your army, and definitely get with the guys here at Jobber. They are awesome people, and uh, talk to us afterwards. Come up and say hello and uh, have a conversation. Thanks, wait, guys. Wait, we got some more stuff to go over, though, real quick. I'll Outside, they're going to be doing a meet and greet at 2 o'clock with a bunch of different YouTubers if you guys want to do that. We are also doing a pizza party at the bowling alley uh, from 5 o'clock to 7 o'clock or 9 o'clock tonight. Wear your orange case t-shirts and you could potentially win $100. Then there's a big party at the Mega Caverns tonight as well. I think that goes from 6 to 9 o'clock. So there's tons of stuff going outside, but every time you go to one of those events, you better darn well be networking and practicing your communication skills everywhere you go, guys. That's all I got to say. God bless. Go get them, you guys. Thanks, uh, Stan and Phil, for the awesome advice on how to build your army.